Hello, beloved of God and of us. Welcome to this recording. Uh, we are talking uh, today. We are going to talk about uh, the, the the title of the presentation is God's structure of salvation. That's also the title of the series that what that I uh, recorded. Uh, I think like two years ago on uh, on this channel. Uh, however. Um, I wanted to call it in, in, in this fellowship video I wanted to call it God's genius the genius of God's plan and of course uh, we're going to th go through the slides I expect that we will not be able to finish so we will do well, let's say the first part and then another time we will do the second part with a short um, uh, recapitulation of the first part I think that's best I have here with me Liam, our dear brother, and uh, how's it going, guys? Yeah, and uh, it's going to be uh, together between Liam and myself, and I would say let's do the start. So uh, let's see. Okay, I think yes, everything is correct. I'm just checking the recording if everything is going well. Yes, everything sure. looks great. All right, so um, this we can we can skip. I mean, this is the these are the standard slides, facts and principle about God's word. We know yeah, about so it. If, so if you want to read this, you can just pause it and then you can read it. As, exactly, and this also for uh, of course this slide. All of God's word is for everyone. So it's also for us. It. However, it's the next inspired by God. As, uh, yeah, and all the truth. However, not all is addressed to everyone, but only Paul's letters are addressed to the believers in this day and age. Not even the believers only, but everyone in this day and age. Paul's letters are addressed to. And of course, the rest of the scripture we can learn from it, but Paul's letters and Paul's evangel is the valid one and the one operational today. <clears throat> but we have to learn in multiple dimensions to correctly cut God's word, or here in this case called the word of truth. And the next slide. <clears throat> so here you see three dimensions. If there are more, please let me know. But there are three here. Evangels, eras, and perspectives. Evangels, because there are two predominant ones, uh, to uh, Israelites and to the Gentiles, and the two evangels are of the circumcision and of the uncircumcision, or the right now in this day and age, I would call it the evangel of the untraceable riches of Christ. Because it, uh, I believe that it started with the uncircumcision, but it shifted towards the unri untraceable riches of Christ. The second dimension is eras, in which period was a certain passage intended for. And the third one is perspective. There are only two flavors, absolute and relative perspective. You have something to add, Liam? Uh, no, I just uh, I totally agree with what you said, especially the perspectives. Because yeah. when we see in Scripture where it says that God changed his mind, like he repented, yeah. that's in the relative perspective. Exactly. That's in the perspective of mankind. You know, we know that God does not repent. He does not change his mind. His plan is perfect, as we're about to find out. So that's a relative state statement. It's relatively true, but in the absolute, he did not change his mind. Exactly. Exactly. So... Uh this is also a very short remark about leadership i'm now as we speak preparing a new study for later in the year uh, for a new series and i will also go through this topic of leadership because it looks like like a management course nothing could be further from the truth this is about truth truth from scripture and leadership has everything to do with that and i will show you the con connection between truth and lie what is that really truth and lie and how does leadership play a role in that that's going to be the the uh, 
let's say more or less the main topic of that study series. So leadership has to do with mindset. Let's, let's, let's go to the last bullet point. Leadership is a mindset, not a position, a mindset. And that's very important. So read about it, uh, read uh, for yourself and I will return to this topic definitely. Okay, so let's start about God's plan, the genius of God's plan. And the question is, before we get to even know or let alone understand God's plan, the first step must be to understand who is God himself. What is our view of God? How do we see him? And the first statement is, God is spirit. This is a literal truth. Anything to add, Liam? No, it's, it's, it's pretty plain. <laughs> yeah, very plain. Yeah. Okay, next one. Now the, the second statement, the set you could say set of statements, but the second one is indeed God is love. That is more of a relative statement, but it literally embodies his personality. That's the point. So he is love. And the third statement is, God is almighty or omnipotent. Both statements here, they are relative, but they are true, totally true. So you could also say absolute, but the, the fact that God is literally spirit, that's an absolute statement. This is not that God is literal love, because love is not a being. Almighty is not a being, that's my point. That's why they are relative statements, but of course absolute in terms of that embodies who God really is in terms of personality. Yep. So let's take a look at uh, and some absolute comments about God's love. So he is love. He is love in the first place. His love, we already know that, hopefully, is unconditional that that means there are no conditions attached to it it's very simple he asks nothing in return it's not possible be because we have nothing to give he gives us always first and always so his love is unconditional and love characterizes god's personality and the essence it's the essence of who God really is. That's love. So God's love never asks anything in return. It's not possible. Because he is the free. one. It's free. He is the one out of whom everything is. That's the whole point. And that is the very meaning of the word unconditional. There's no conditions, no small letters. And God's love is the only force that will remain as the glorious victor when his plan of creation uh, or with creation is completed. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is the grand plan. And when we say love, we're talk talking about agape love, divine love, unconditional love. Yep. We're not speak speaking about like a Valentine's Day kind of love, like exactly. a human form of love, which is conditional. This is unconditional, divine, agape love. If you truly realize this, as I uh, realized it in the past, a weight will literally fall from your shoulders, you could say. Okay, yes. let's continue. Second, or the third statement, you could say, God is spirit, God is love, God is almighty, omnipotent. And these are, again, absolute comments about the fact that God is almighty. God conceived... He designed and he made everything in the universe. He sustains, don't forget that part, he sustains everything in the universe by his spirit continuously from the smallest atomic particle to the largest so-called Milky Way. Doesn't matter, he sustains everything according to laws, universal laws, he himself also designed and created. Also, everything is drenched with God. Everything. From the largest universe, again, to the smallest atomic particle. He gives to everything and everyone their attributes, making them behave the way He wants them to behave. 
and every kind of material has certain uh, properties that allow it to be used by creatures in a certain way and that is all determined by God and given to the material that's how it yeah, works so God is sovereign he's in control of all <laughs> things and when we and when we say all things we mean everything in existence everything is underneath the supreme will of God and that proves that he is all might mighty he has all the authority all the power, power, power to do anything that he wants, but that's in his plan, of course. Exactly, yes. So, knowledge, let's, let's take a look at that phrase, that earlier phrase, everything is conceived, designed, and created by God. So, knowledge and understanding given to creatures for the use of certain materials, that is God given laws of nature by which there is a certain order and structure in the observable world given by God spiritual you could say invisible laws also structured always work according to a certain system and order given by God every living being according to certain working values God given any type of creature which with determined specific characteristics again God given right amount of knowledge power will faith evil creativity etc per creature per moment or era also given by God wow that yeah does away with man's free will right there oh yes completely and by <laughs> the way what a free will is it's not the ability to make a choice because we make choi choices all the time what a free will is, is to make a choice that's outside of the plan of God. Yep. And just like he said, all things are in accord with the counsel of his will. Yeah. So it's impossible to make a choice that's outside of God's plan, which means you do not have a free will. Exactly. You have a will, but it's not free and independent from the sovereign will of God Almighty. Exactly. Exactly. So, two very well-known passages. Let's read it. Acts 17, 24 through 25 the God who makes the world and all that is in it he the Lord inherent of heaven and earth is not dwelling in temples made by hand please get it in your head neither is he attended by human hands as if requiring anything since he himself gives to all life and bread and all well more clear i i cannot be more clear scripture is here very clear i think and acts uh, 17 28 three verses later for in him in god we are living and moving and are just are can you imagine this as some poets of you also have declared for of that race also are we everything is in God everything happens in God it's quite simple yeah so keep that in mind as we go through these slides that everything this whole plan everything that has occurred in creation from the beginning all the way to the end is all a part of God's plan and is for a purpose all the good is for a purpose and we're about to discover that and all the evil is also for the same purpose <laughs> so God has a purpose with creation and that purpose, remember this, is driven by love. It's fueled by love. Very important. So his omnipotence, uh, he uses to accomplish his love-driven purpose. So, in short, you could say, God's omnipotence serves his love. It's in the light of his love. That's very important to realize. Yeah, because he can't go against who he is. Exactly. God is God is love. So yeah. what his plan is going to result in is the maximum extent and expression of his love. Yes. Which proves that he's going to save all things and bring all things into a new creation where there is no sin and death. Yep, exactly. So you could have objections, especially you, Christian or religious person. You could say, yes, but... But God is also just, or he is also righteous, remember? 
and uh, then you say because of the fact that God is righteous bad people get their due or you could say but God is also holy and because of his holiness he cannot stand sin and will get rid of bad people via uh, annihilation as an example or destruction or be eternal torment in fire and our question will be this is your god schizophrenic yes or no <laughs> it's simple it's simple because i say that god is love i say that god is omnipotent both are true and you say yes but yes but yes but so are you saying that god has other attributes that are contradicting his love is that what you're saying like his love like yeah. reflect his love his, yeah. yes he is just but his justice will result in their salvation he's of going course. to judge the world but it's not for their sins because God has dealt with sin at the cross that's exactly. the good news yep. they will be yep. judged in, in accord with their acts and eventually they will be saved and reconciled back to God they will be rehabilitated eventually exactly. that does not mean that he's not going to judge the world <laughs> we're not like uh the Christian universalists who say that God is not going to judge the world. He will judge the world because, yep. like, because as they say, God is just. But yep. that ju justice does not conflict his love because he yep. is love. Judging means setting straight. It's that simple. That's what judging means. Right. So if you remember that, then you will see that his judgment also works in light of his loving purpose. All right next yeah, one and, and he's not going to torture the unbelievers that's exactly. not a just thing to do no what, what's the purpose of tormenting some some someone yeah. in fire let let alone let alone without ending but okay <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> okay other uh, so objections is god schizophrenic you answer that for yourself of course it, does god have attributes in himself that are contradictory to his love and omnipotence of course not of course not god's justice is precisely an affirmation of his love he is just because he is loving that's why and god's holiness is precisely an extension of his omnipotence it's that simple so remember that and how about god's wisdom now we're getting closer to his plan the genius behind his plan god's incomprehensible great greatness has just been expressed with feeble feeble human efforts we have just our vocabulary to try to describe uh, some attributes of god however when we talk about god's wisdom there comes an apparent twist in this description description we know by now that god has a brilliant purpose for his creation love driven and his yeah i already said it his purpose is driven by his all encompassing love we know that that's by the now grand plan the exactly big, big picture the big yes picture. yes exactly so how can god's purpose be divined it's quite simple really it's a relationship between God and his entire creation based on mutual unconditional love mutual both directions unconditional yes. love so to realize this purpose God has of course uh, designed and implemented a genius plan of action I'm about to find out because in order for us to understand the true depths of his love that is unconditional no matter what we do we have to be made imperfect by design we have to be flawed by design we have to sin so then the question pose poses so who is the one who ultimately causes us to sin like who's the one who planned it all out so that we would be born with sin and death it was god why so that he could have grace on us so he could save us all through his son's death and tomb and resurrection for our sins which will reveal to us his unconditional love through his grace and that's the genius oh that's at least a part of the genius plan of god yep he is himself the creator designer writer and director of course every creature has a role in his plan at the end 
everyone has fulfilled their role and also accomplished their role. The main role is Jesus the Christ, the only begotten Son of God. And the role of the opponent, the bad guy in the story, is Satan. Again, Satan uh, is the bad guy, the opponent. Whose opponent? The opponent of human beings. That's the point. He is not the opponent of God. Of course not. That's laughable. Satan is not the opponent of God. Satan is the opponent of human beings and that's how God has created it. That's the point. God is above every party, of course. So Satan means opponent or adversary and devil means through caster, the one who is bringing confusion, throwing everything uh, in between each other, so to speak. So these are roles only roles and that also says that devil can never have been a good angel in the past called lucifer it's not possible yeah exactly exactly so he designed him to be an asshole exactly remember that one very important okay let's continue so the most important and fundamental element in god's genius plan is contrast contrast because thanks to contrast he will god will accomplish his purpose with all creation it's only one way in order for god's love to be recognized by creature uh, by creatures acknowledged first recognized that's because of contrast acknowledged appreciated thanked for and returned mutual remember yes and let's take a look then at some characteristics that god has so, given to man please continue before you do that I, yeah. I would love to give a great example of contrast look at the screen look at the background and notice that it's white now look at now look at the letters and notice that it's blue if the screen was not white let's say if the screen was blue you wouldn't be you wouldn't see what's on the screen because in order to see what's on the screen, you need the contrast of the white and the blue to actually understand what's being said. That's how important contrast is. That's what God does with good and bad, with hot and cold. You can't understand the good without understanding the bad first. Shall I, shall it's I... It's God's plan in a nutshell. Exactly. Shall, shall I, again, uh, put some additional remarks there? Let, let's ahead. turn it around. So let's take your example, Liam, and let me uh, say it the other way around. So the background is white of this slide. Let's say that there was a big, uh, a word with big letters, L-O-V-E, and those letters are in white also. Love in white. And we are looking at the, at the slide, at the screen right now. What do we see if the letters are white? What do we see? Nothing, nothing. nothing. We see only white because the background is white this is exactly what our friends or friends adam and eve saw in the garden before they ate of that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil that's what they saw they didn't see god they couldn't recognize god's love they couldn't even that's why they couldn't acknowledge his love or even appreciate etc etc that's why contrast is so important and necessary in God's plan. Which explains why this world is so filled full with suffering and wickedness and why we sin to begin with, so we can understand the unconditional love of God. Exactly. We can see the words love because the world is black and it highlights God's love, which is pure white. And please don't think that it will stay that way. <laughs> It will not stay that way. Not. God, temporary. exactly. Temporary. God will use evil until a certain point that it is full, fully grown, so to speak. And then later at the end of his plan, he will remove evil like a very ugly, uh, I don't even know the English word that is used to build a house or to build a building. Then you have those things that the painter is standing on and the, and the, and the, uh, the carpenters are standing upon and then if the house is still ugly but if the house is finished those things are being removed and then you can yeah. admire the beauty of that building that's the point yeah. so 
uh, some characteristics that God has given to man. No, pay attention here because they seem contradictory to God's purpose with man. Again, God's genius way of working, right? First characteristic, every man and woman, of course, have a consciousness of God within us. That a consciousness that there is a higher power outside of ourselves, higher than ourselves. The second characteristic is the desire that every human has for a happy ending. If you watch a movie, or read a book, you want a happy ending in your heart, always. Every normal being uh, or human being wants that. So when you go through that story, it's an unconscious desire, but it is put in us by God. The second characteristic, the tendency to violate commandment or prohibitions. When you say to that little child, we have three boxes here, a red and a yellow and a green one, and uh, you can go, you can eat from the red and the yellow uh, and the green one, but from the middle yellow, you're not allowed to eat. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to go now. In 10 minutes, I, re I, I return. What do you think will happen? <laughs> I mean, children are honest, so that's why I use children as an example. They will, the other, uh, the other ones, the red and the green are not interesting anymore. Only the middle one. The, the yellow it's one curiosity. it's a mystery always and God has put that in us precisely that which is not allowed becomes attractive next one yeah by design flawed exactly. by design exactly exactly the tendency to idolize other visible for us visible creatures it, maybe it's a celebrity or a politician while well, that can also be a celebrity of course only then such a person is interesting when that person was unknown or poor then it's not interesting to us no when they became well known and famous and rich then they are interesting to us that's how we are built as humans the next one is eager to earn their own rewards to get to receive acknowledgement compliments finances power we love that even if we try to deny it we love it in our hearts we like it self-control it's about self-control it's put in us by the god and the last one is the tendency to punish another being another creature who deserved it in our eyes so if let's say injustice in our eyes has been committed according to us then we have the tendency to punish the other one because they have done injustice to us or to someone else we love as an example all these all are characteristics that god uh, has put in us in us and point five and six are fulfillment of course of that sense of accomplishment that we have in us that's the point exactly point four is re really really good because in order to appreciate god and to understand that he's the only one who deserves uh, our wor worship and praise we have to have went through the experience of worshiping a celebrity or a man so that we know now what it feels like to worship the one true God. And that's one of the many uh, examples of why he would do that, to give us the experience of contrast. Exactly, exactly. So then the question becomes, if God is putting or has put all those characteristics in humans that are tending to even go contradictory to God, to what God wants from us, how is that possible so what is then god's real approach to the ultimate salvation of his creation well let's take a look god's real approach approach is in contrast <laughs> to our human sense of justice we have a sense of justice that you can say it's like quid pro quo so give a little take a little keep it in balance that is the righteousness that we are used to 
we we call that righteousness and that will be the righteousness in the fourth eon in the next era of the millennial kingdom that's the righteousness that will be uh prevalent in that kingdom give a little take right. a little righteousness balance uh so but now manifestation of god's perfect righteousness is always apart from human works from human righteousness it is namely based purely on jesus christ's faith that's another story that's not the righteousness of quid pro quo no way this is another story this is the story of grace believe in the fact that jesus died for our sins was entombed and has been roused the third day according to the scripture this is simply impossible for a human to do by themselves according to their sense of righteousness and why is that the case why is it impossible it, it requires faith faith which accords with grace let's continue romans 3 1 we know that already no one is just not even one no one is seeking god no one has understood no one and that is no one in comparison with god's righteousness that's the point no one can even come close to god's perfect righteousness and that is now in the plan that god has for us humans that is founded on upon the faith of jesus christ in his father that was displayed in the garden of gethsemane and it's for all and it is on all who currently believe and that says that's as in romans 3 21 22. you had a you had an addition Oh, no, uh, I was just going to say what you're about to say. Faith is a gift from God. So it's not exactly. like every single man has this faith. Exactly. Faith is a gift that's granted to us. Yes. The one who has faith, the one who saved us with his faith is Jesus Christ. Yes. And the righteousness of God is being grand granted to all those who believe in this, which, like I said, faith comes from God. So you can't yeah. even boast in the faith that you have. Nope, nope. However, Christians... When I talk to Christians about this, then they say, but we must believe as if it comes from us. And right, I say, exactly. no, 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 no. We must not believe. Of course, belief is a condition. However, that condition is also granted by God. That's the point. Faith is, as Liam already said, and as scripture says, also a gift of God. Ephesians 2, verse 8, Romans 12, verse 3, Philippians 1, verse 29 so yes important yeah exactly so it's not our faith that saves us it's christ's faith that saves us and it's not salvation that's on the ta table here it's life in the ages that are to come yep and that's what we get uh, among more things when we become a believer which is it comes from god the belief that we have comes through faith and faith is a gift from god so we exactly can't this. and it's it's not our faith that saves us. It's Christ's faith that has saved us, past tense. Exactly. Well, let's read Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. For in grace, through faith, are you saved. And this is not out of you. It is God's approach present, not of works, lest anyone should be boasting. And this package, the whole package, in grace, through faith are we saved, not out of us. The whole package is God's approach present. And we are not involved at all in this present. We have nothing to uh, bring to the table, nothing whatsoever. Grace is always free, always. And that is the reason why the normal human being without Holy Spirit doesn't trust grace exactly because it requires faith the exactly. only way that you can believe this to be true because everything else is screaming at, 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 at you saying that this is false is faith so god is in control of who believes in this and who does not exactly and people have great difficulty in accepting grace it doesn't appear 
appeal to their false tendencies of righteousness because grace is not righteousness no it's way higher than righteousness but in the evangel of the kingdom there you see the majority of the bastard mixed message and churches the result of those messages is self-righteousness that's the point and that is mixing the evangel of the kingdom which is the biggest part in their message with a little bit of the evangel of paul that's impossible they are totally not compatible that's the whole point that's why you are not to mix it and that's what happen uh, happens in churches massively so why does god, uh, does god act so contrary to our human inclination why is that first of all this is what god will accomplish with us every creature will come to the end of themselves that's why that that's why god acts contrary to our human tendency there oh at the end of ourselves awaits the deep realization then we that we cannot do nothing without god we can do nothing without god that is also where the maximum contrast arises between the absolute bottom of ourselves the end of ourselves and the unlimited glory of god maximum contrast and that results in the experience and the appreciation of maximum glory through that same contrast yeah as the death of your pride as the death of the self and instead you put it all onto god exactly that's why we say it, it's not through your free will it's not through your faith it's not through your decision to accept christ into your heart that saves you it's god through christ that has saved you past tense and he gives you the faith to believe in this so you cannot boast in this and when you understand that that you can do nothing but sin and you deserve not nothing but to just die for what you've done yet god has granted you all of this and it's all free and all you have to do is just believe it and then he grants you the faith to believe in that that kills you it kills your pride you die to self and then you're alive in christ because we're an entirely new creation in christ exactly and talking about the end of ourselves we call let me call that home home because that's where we belong at the end of ourselves because we have nothing and we cannot do anything so if we are there home before we get home just normally uh, logically speaking uh who is the farthest away from home i would say the people with the largest form of self righteousness that's the point yes so like the larger the yeah, yeah the larger the self righteousness the farther away from the end of ourselves that we are that's the point remember that also dear religious person and especially christian so god cho- chooses precisely those whom he makes unimportant for a purpose in the eyes of the world why again every creature then comes to the end of themselves there is no cause whatsoever for glory in them to be found not possible that's the point there awaits the deep shame of those who thought they were righteous of their own and everyone will come there at that point i assure you because of that god alone gets unlimited glory that is the whole purpose and in the end god will truly become all in all wow that makes so much sense because for god to be all in all he has to be all to all and if you're bo- boasting in yourself because you made the right uh, the right choice for christ or you're bo- boasting because you put your faith in christ or because because it's your works then god is not all to you because there's still that 1% of you that's still alive because exactly. you're not dead to self yep yep exactly so let's read about the people who are chosen by god 1st Corinthians 1:27 through 20 uh, 31 but the stupidity of the world god chooses ha ah, oh boy 
Oh boy. That he may be disgracing the wise. Look at that. And the weakness of the world God chooses that he may be disgracing the strong and the ignoble and the contemptible things of the world God chooses uh, and that which is not that he should be discarding that which is or thinks it is so that no flesh at all uh, should be boasting that's the whole reason no flesh at all should be boasting in God's sight yet you of him are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God besides righteousness and holiness and deliverance that according as it is written he who is boasting in the Lord let him be boasting yes. because that's the only place to be able to boast in the Lord only we can boast in Christ and him crucified that's it that's it exactly so let's revisit our statements here and a little bit we're going to extend it now again what's our view of god how do we see god god is love and because he is love he wants to save everyone and the second statement is god is almighty or omnipotent and because he is omnipotent he can save everyone both are true remember it both are true okay let's use yeah, logic let's. here let's use logic next one let's just again use logic how do we look at god first of all we can ask ourselves is god immeasurably greater than his creatures both with regard uh, to love and omnipotence I would say yes and I would say every Christian would say yes right every Christian would say yes on this question okay we have the politically correct answer here so the next question is when do we approach the proper view of God the first question answered by yes when do we do we approach that as close as possible in our human terms when is that the case let's go to the next one it's simple if we assign properties that what is it increase his omnipotence or decrease his omnipotence what do we do in order to as closely as possible approach the proper view of God what would we say we increase them. of course increase every omnipotence characteristics of god as much as possible even then we cannot be coming close but we are we are at least closer than than when we would decrease his omnipotence right same question about love if we assign properties that increase his uh, unconditional love or decrease his unconditional love of Which course makes sense why why they want to decrease it yeah because they want to disprove the salvation of all they want to say no 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 yeah. he just saves the believers and yeah in order to be saved you have to do something yeah you have to do a b and c yes to get x y and z yes but Which that makes sense why they would do that but the thing is if they if they say that that we have to do something that means we are responsible for our our eternal so-called e eternal destiny if that's the case that means that God's omnipotence is smaller they yes. they decrease his omnipotence that's the point because God apparently is not able to save uh, to 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 give us a will that is totally influenced by him probably he's not able that's the point maybe and about his yeah. love or he doesn't love us enough that's also a possibility huh? or not Christian think about it for yourself God has the power to do so and he has the desire to do so he wills all to be saved and he has the power to do so and he accomplished that on the cross. both both that are true good news. exactly exactly so let's continue and let's see what's happening so 
increase or decrease his omnipotence have does god have the total control over evil as an example this is a test question this is a test question does your god have total control over evil precisely because he also created evil for his purpose yes or no dear christian what is the what is your answer and in the same way the second test question about god's love is god your god still love if he gives a free will free will to his creatures so a will that is not influenced by him knowing what its dire consequences of that free will will be does he give free will to his creatures a loving god think about it logically if you have That's a, a one, yeah if you have a one year old child and you're sitting at the uh, at the table with them they they uh, they just ate or whatever and they are thirsty but now there is a little bottle with cleaning <laughs> with a nice blue glass X cleaning uh, deterrent or detergent or whatever for the house. And it's nice and blue and oh, that looks attractive to the kid. One year, one and a half year old. If you leave that detergent uh, within reach of that child, they will grab it and drink it. That's what will happen. Yeah. So as it's a- It's about responsibility. Uh, so who's responsible for salvation here? Yep. Is it me or is it God? Does God put the, does does God put the responsibility of salvation in the hands of a sinner? Exactly. That is irresponsible and it's incompetent. Exactly. And if you would leave that detergent with your child, your one and a half year old child, it would be a re irresponsible thing to do of you. That's the point. And th that same free will is the same as that detergent same thing it has dire consequences okay so now we know that god is more loving and greater than our wildest imaginations so let's take some let's look at some examples everything in god's plan is driven driven by his unconditional love whatever we do wrong so to speak it cannot bother him really definitely not it can bother him relatively but it's not real bothering he 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 fun he does it functionally that's the point he acts just like he acts in the in the garden of eden when he said adam where are you as if he didn't know where adam was same thing he was acting second everything in the universe is created and directed by god so the consequence of that is that no creature can have a free will we have a will as already mentioned but it's not free from god's influence it's impossible second uh, the next one god's word consists only of inspired that means carefully chosen words words that are uh, purified seven times in a kiln according to psalm psalms 12 verse 6 and the last one here the writing style look at this <laughs> of those who recorded god's word has been left completely intact by god can you imagine so the words are totally inspired by god through his spirit but the writing style god has left intact so it was not like god says you have to write this and this and this no they write according to their own style but every word is inspired man i cannot understand that with my with my normal brain what are the odds of that in maths it's, i mean that's got to be one in a trillion yeah, trillion trillion trill, exactly that's just impossible to calculate <laughs> exactly exactly so now so sometimes christians say to me is god god is a gentleman remember god is a ge no he will never force you to choose no 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 he's a gentleman let's take a look if he is that much of a gentleman according to scripture first of all first example god himself causes gog that leader of the land of magog to go up against against his people his own people read about that in ezekiel 39 and uh, 38 and 39 second one god calls a wicked king cyrus 
my shepherd because he wants something for him and he gets it Isaiah 44:28 Next one God hardens and shows mercy to whomever he wants Romans 9:18 God himself shall send a strong delusion on earth. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 11. It is God who provoked Satan to attack our friend Job. Job 1, 8 and 2, 3. But God also placed the appropriate limitations on Satan in the case of Job as an example. Say, he's in control exactly of the exactly in total control that's the point yeah, let's go exactly. so he's not a gentleman he's the director of, <laughs> all of, of all of creation he's the director yes creation has no choice and we have a nice verse for that remember that that first in romans 8 uh, 19 but let's continue here is god a gentleman Let's continue. Saul, the fanatical Pharisee, had no choice when the grace of Christ Jesus overwhelmed him. Look at that word, overwhelmed. He had no choice for that, for that matter at all. Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26. No choice. Remember that one, Christian. Those who are perishing because they don't what? They don't receive hey wait a minute receive from who the love of the truth they don't receive from whom from god of course from god god doesn't give it to them the love of the truth he withholds the love of the truth from them oh boy so think about this if you have to believe to be saved if it's just the believers are going to be saved and god who's and he's the one who's withholding the truth from them does that mean that he has cho chosen them to go into hell <laughs> and they have not, nothing to do with it he, he, even though that he expressly said that he wills and desires all to be saved yet he's withholding the truth from them to be saved that makes no sense impossible that makes absolutely no sense nope. if that's true then god is incompetent yes totally yes but we know what the end game is in God's plan. That's the whole point. That's why we are at peace. That's the point. Let's continue. Does not God say that he himself created evil? Isaiah 45, 7. Did he not create the destroyer? Not just the destroyer, but to destroy. Isaiah 54, 16. So being a gentleman has nothing to do with love <laughs> love is the strongest force in the universe and conquers all you cannot withstand god's love impossible god is just working out his plan that's the whole point he created a task for himself to exactly. prove to all of creation that he is sovereign that he is in control and that he can do whatever he likes if he sets his mind to do some something although all of the religions of this world will say that it's impossible god could not save all of humanity he's going to do that and their mouths are going to drop to the floor when that occurs amen amen let's continue look as as an example at the diminishing power and strength of satan just a little example because at first we can even go further because satan was attacking job etc all under the control of god but let's take jude 6. at first the archangel michael the strong archangel michael he dared not accuse satan he dared not accuse satan so you think wow that's a great power and strength of Satan. Uh-uh. Next one. Then there's the first war in the heavens before Michael defeats the dragon, which is Satan, each with their group of angels. Revelation 12, verse 7 through 12. So Michael defeats, but he doesn't defeat immediately. No, he defeats after a war, and we don't know how long that war was. Remember it. But then all of a sudden now, later, 
one angel who is not an archangel, not Michael, just a, a normal angel is enough to pick Satan, Satan up, bind him. So go with the chain, pick him up, bind him, and throw him in the submerged chaos. Revelation 20, verse 1 through 3. How about that? So you see how Satan's power is diminishing. Who is turning the knobs? Who is turning those parameters? Of Think course it's it, God. Christian. Think about it. Yeah, I mean, come on. This is all... He's um, the one who's in control <laughs> of the adversary. Then yeah. How can he lose to his own creation? Yep. It's impossible. Think impossible. About it. It's just like the story of Samson. Where did he get all that strength from? Did it just come from him? Did he go to the gym? No, it came from <laughs> God. He's the one who granted that strength. Exactly, exactly. So, think about it. Let's continue. Um, we, yeah, we still have a couple of slides. So, look at this passage as an example. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7 through 8. Very well-known passage. But we are speaking of God's wisdom in a secret. Wisdom which has deliberately, I add, been concealed which God designates before, before the eons for our glory. Which, now it comes, not one of the chief men of this eon knows, for if they know, they wouldn't crucify the Lord of glory. And I think the word man is not in the, if I uh, remember correctly, it's not in the, uh, in the word of God. It has been put in light face type. So the chiefs, whether it is man or it is a celestial beings, not one of the chiefs of this eon knows. Because if they knew, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Wow. So why does God do these things? He keeps things secret from us. He keeps things secret from other humans, from, from celestial beings. Why? Look at the genius of God's plan. God gives exactly what is needed and when to the right person in his plan. It doesn't matter who they are. They are all fulfilling their role in God's plan. This applies, for example, to the necessary knowledge, but also the necessary evil that God gives, strength, illness, wisdom, stubbornness, unwillingness, faith, it's all given by God. It's the sovereign God. The result of this way of working is that every creature does exactly what God wants. <laughs> when he wants it and to the extent that he wants it. And at the same time, the creature instinctively makes their own choice while being completely, 100% completely, influenced by god directly or indirectly this exactly. is perfect execution of god's plan it is assured yeah. and the perfect realization of his loving purpose is with this also assured that's so the point all the so all the choi choices and the paths that we walk in this life yes we make those uh, uh those paths uh, by ourselves which is a relative state statement but in the absolute god is the one who has pre-planned all of them yeah, so we exactly. get both of them so yes we get to experience our life and we get to go out there and make mistakes and things like this but in the absolute we know that it's god who's doing the whole thing he's orchestrating the whole thing that gives you peace that god is in control and not you because if you are in control the whole thing would be a mess Exactly. And if you look outside it, well it is a mess for now but it's not going to be a mess like that forever because God is going to reconcile the whole thing back to him into a new creation. Exactly. Which proves that God is in control and not you. Yep, definitely. So the end result of God's genius plan, we can find that that's the absolute result in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 28, where it says, Now, whenever all may be subjected to him, and that is the Son in this case, then this, that's Jesus Christ, then the Son himself also shall be subjected to him, God the Father, who subjects all to him, the Son. That God may be all in all, meaning everyone, no exception. 
So who does the subject? Uh, who does the subjecting? God the Father. Lord. Who is the active party? Who does? Who does everything? God the Father. Who is therefore the passive party? Everyone else. Everyone else. Every creature. Every creature is the passive party. Exactly. And what is the total result? All things are out of God, through God, and to God. Into and God. If, and if you look in the Greek, yeah, that's what I was about to say. If you look in the Greek, it says into. So yeah. it's all out of, through, and eventually all will return back into God. Exactly. But they, they will have learned his one true love. They will have established a relationship with him. So God created all things, but he desires a relationship with his own creatures. Exactly. How is he going to do that? Well, he has to make himself known. How does he make himself known? Through contrast, just like we said, with love is white, with, uh, with the background that's white. The background has to be black. Now we can understand God's grace because we all sin. Yeah, he saves us all through his grace. Let me, let me. That is the let me let God in a nutshell. Yeah, exactly. Let me add something just to eliminate eliminate a, uh, any misunderstanding here. Uh, Liam just said it fantastically about the con about the contrast principle. However, there is a difference between on the one hand uh, good and evil, and on the other hand the knowledge of good and evil. Those are two different things. So God uses. The knowledge of good and he let me put it differently. He uses the contrast between good and evil, and he gives us the knowledge of that contrast in order to for us to become uh, mature in understanding what's going on in God's plan. And at the end of his plan, then he doesn't e need evil anymore. But what will remain? with us all is the knowledge of good and evil that will remain so he will yes. remove yes. the yes. evil yes. itself but our knowledge of good and evil will remain and that's what will make us acknowledge and uh, uh recognize god's love and that's why we will exactly. we will return his love gladly and thankfully because we have that knowledge and we will always have that knowledge of good and evil you see the point very important yeah, exactly okay uh one other slide well we have still i think two or three sl slides to go to okay. finish the first part so this is just like a recapitulation what is our view of god how do we see him he is love that means he wants to save everyone he is almighty or omnipotent and he can save everyone both are true so let's continue so if both are true if both just the logic logical thinking if both of these statements are true god wants to save everyone and he can save everyone both are true what is the only possible outcome of course he's going to save the entire creation of but, uh, course of course, of course so he's he and will save everyone that we spoke about free will because a christian will say yeah but free will stands in the way well how can man have a free will when god is directing his will exactly that's not possible nope and trust me god directing our will is way better than we directing our own will <laughs> not even oh, yes. comparable <laughs> So this is the only possible outcome. God will save everyone. That's the From death. Exactly. Because the largest enemy in God's plan is not Satan. No, 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 no. It is death. Death yep. is the enemy. And that will also be the last. Death is non existence. Yeah. And the last enemy is also death. That will be abolished. And that is not the first death. No, no, no. Because the first death was, and, and Hades, the, the, the kingdom of death, so to speak, were already thrown in the lake of fire, which is the second death. So what is the last enemy? It's obviously the second death. Very important. Yeah. 
And if death is going to be abolished, it means that all those who are dead and all those who are decaying have to be made alive beyond the reach of death. Logical. Which means they have to be immortal. And if they're immortal, it means they're saved. Because in order to be immortal, you have to be saved. Exactly. So that's clear proof that God is going to save all because he's going to abolish the sin, the death. All of the bad is going to go away. Yet we will keep the... Uh, the the memories of the bad so we can appreciate the good so we don't forget it exactly exactly uh let's do i think maybe we should should end here maybe th this okay. is a nice a nice slide to end by the way yeah, let sure. me let me add something uh, about uh, god creating evil in isaiah 45 verse 7 uh, it's already mentioned in the past, but it's good to mention it uh, multiple times. And that is, Scripture says clearly that God created evil and He made good. There is a difference between the two. He didn't create good because He is already good from Himself, out of Himself. So the goodness is in Him already. So He made good in terms of He made it visible to His creatures. But no, he just, created like evil. Yeah. yeah, but he created evil because evil wasn't existing yet. That's the point. Exactly. That's the point. It's very important to remember. And at the end, he will also remove evil. will not be necessary anymore. Yes, that is the plan of God in a nutshell. And you can rest now and know that God is in control and not you. That gives me peace. Exactly. Because if I was in control, you guys would be screwed. <laughs> and that also goes for me, please. <laughs> so uh, now I hope you already seen uh, the genius of God's plan, that God is so smart to create human beings with attributes that are, they seem to contradict his plan with you humanity but that is to make humans come to a place which is the end of themselves so that they will realize for the hundred percent realize that it is all god who does it and it is only god's grace that saves them and nothing else that is the point Amen. very important any yeah, addition so, uh Nope, that's, I, I think you've just said the whole thing there. So tune in, uh, not next week, I don't know when we're going to do the second half. Uh, Let's but see. we're going to do the second half at some point. Yeah. So we'll end uh, So we'll end this one here, and uh, you can tune in next week or the week after that when we when we post the next part. So yeah. love, grace, and peace to you all, the eyes of your heart, have, having been enlightened to the truth. All the best to you, love, grace, and peace, and I hope to see you next time. God bless you. Peace out, guys. Bye-bye.